Our lactose non-fermenting bacteria are intrinsically resistant to many antimicrobials and are therefore potentially quite challenging to treat. These bacteria are ubiquitous in the environment and some of them, like Pseudomonas aeruginosa, actually smell quite delicious. The term non-fermenters isn't a taxonomic designation. This is really a grouping of convenience from a diagnostic perspective. The organisms we'll be talking about today range from biocontainment levels one all the way up to three, with Pseudomonas and Stenotrophomonas species being containment levels one to two, Burkholderia capetia, which I'm only mentioning for completeness sake, is level two, while Burkholderia malii and Pseudomalii are both level three. These are gram-negative rods to cocobacilli, and like I said, they are famous for intrinsic resistance, so therapeutic selection can be very, very challenging. Pseudomonas aeruginosa, probably the most commonly encountered of our non-fermentative species, is well known for producing an alginate biofilm, and Pseudomonas is also well known for its green coloration. Here you can see a pure culture of Pseudomonas aeruginosa on blood agar. Uh, the colonies have this sort of metallic sheen, which really varies with uh, how the light is hitting it. These colonies have a really characteristic smell. It's described as fruity or floral. Uh, some people think it smells like grapes, and I've also heard it described as having a wet corn tortilla smell. Here's another example of Pseudomonas aeruginosa on blood agar. You can see the light's hitting it just a little bit differently here, so the metallic sheen is somewhat muted. On the right, we have Pseudomonas aeruginosa on Mueller Hinton agar, and what I think you can really appreciate here is the production of blue-green pigments, which are really characteristic of this species. Here you can see Stenotrophomonas maltophila on blood agar. These colonies are very dark and are quite foul smelling. They have an ammonia-like odor. This is a gram stain of Pseudomonas aeruginosa displaying these medium to large uh, gram-negative rod-shaped bacteria. Our non-fermenters are ubiquitous. They are widely disseminated in the environment, in aquatic and marine ecosystems. Pseudomonas aeruginosa will happily survive on surfaces all over the place, including in the hospital environment. Burkholderia malii is host adapted and is found primarily associated with equids, including horses and donkeys, and it really doesn't survive well outside the host. The other important species of Burkholderia, Pseudomalii, is ubiquitous in the environment, um, and it's found in the water and soil in equatorial regions. Typically, we think of it uh, being present only in the, the tropics, so between 20 degrees south and 20 degrees north. Taxonomically, these bacteria are quite divergent, so we're talking about organisms even in different bacterial phyla today. You can see our Pseudomonas, Stenotrophomonas, and Acinetobacters are all within the same class. They're all gamma proteobacteria. Our Burkholderia are beta proteobacteria, um, as is Alkaligenes. And then on the left, in our phylum Bacteroidetes, uh, we have our Elizabeth Kinga and Bergiella. Um, Elizabeth Kinga causes similar opportunistic infections that we might see with uh, Stenotrophomonas or Cynidobacter, while Bergiella has been associated with dog bite wounds. The virulence factors of Pseudomonas aeruginosa have been reasonably well studied. Um, it's recognized for its ability to quorum sense, which is the ability of bacteria to sense their density in a population, so how many of them are present. This quorum sensing ability allows them to determine what stage of an infection they're in and when it's time to move on to the next stage. So maturation of a biofilm, when the cells need to become motile and swim to another location, etc. They produce elastases, so enzymes which damage blood vessels and lung tissues. They also interfere with neutrophil function. Siderophores. So those pigments that Pseudomonas aeruginosa produces, those blue and green pigments, are actually iron scavenging molecules, um, which result in that characteristic color. Pseudomonas aeruginosa produces type 3 secretion systems, which allows effector molecules to be excreted. Um, it allows them to damage host tissues or potentially other bacteria as well. 
And then finally, it's famous for the production of alginate biofilms. So this is a slimy matrix that's produced by some strains, which prevents phagocytosis and allows the cells to persist in environments which may be hostile. So including in the human body where we may have antibiotics, those antibiotics are not able to adequately penetrate the biofilm um, protecting the organism. Pseudomonas aeruginosa is well recognized as an opportunistic pathogen. When we have a debilitated host, it is happy to come in and set up an infection. In people, it's perhaps most notorious for causing cystic fibrosis associated pneumonia. In cattle, we can see mastitis. In dogs, chronic and recurrent uh, otitis and pyoderma. And then septicemia in our ectothermic species, birds and lab animals. Pseudomonas fluorescens causes septicemia in tail rot or fin rot in fish, while stenotrophomonas causes septicemia in reptiles and amphibians. Acinetobacter baumannii is also another opportunistic bacteria that will happily cause infections in a variety of species given the opportunity. And Burkholderia mallei causes a disease known as glanders. Um, in horses, we frequently see chronic glanders, while in donkeys, dogs, and cats, it presents as an acute disease. And in people, it's also known as glanders. Burkholderia pseudomallei has a much broader host range, and its disease is colloquially known as either pseudoglanders or melioidosis. So Pseudomonas aeruginosa, like I said, it is an opportunistic infection. It rarely causes primary infections. So when one of your patients cultures positive for Pseudomonas, you need to think about what is the underlying disease? Why does this animal have an infection? And then address that primary cause. It can infect many species at a variety of anatomical sites. Um, and some more common presentations include pneumonia and farmed mink and pigs, otitis, pneumonia, sepsis, and sudden death in chinchillas, sepsis in poultry, mastitis in ruminants, otitis externa in dogs. So you can see its broad host range and the diversity of presentations which are recognized. In dogs, we see uh, primarily otitis externa and pyoderma. And this occurs in animals following round after round of therapy and round after round of therapy where we aren't addressing the underlying cause. So continued courses of antimicrobials without figuring out what's going on to predispose that animal to otitis. It also infects corneal ulcers and is a cause of melting ulcers in horses. Um, in these two images here, you can see a, a melting ulcer in a horse, um, this very uh, edematous or cloudy looking cornea um, and this depressed region here where I think you can appreciate there's been some uh, erosion of the uh, normal tissues. On the right here, we have a canine cornea um, with a large uh, ulcerative lesion. Here's a picture of a melting ulcer in a dog. Um, you can see just how abnormal this cornea is. And I wanted to point out that this dog's eye has been stained with fluorescein dye. Um, this is a dye which only attaches to ulcers, so it won't bind to the um, normal intact surface of the cornea. And the presence of the dye is what's responsible for this green color. This green pigmentation is not because of the Pseudomonas aeruginosa. It's the fluorescein dye. Pseudomonas aeruginosa is the most commonly isolated Pseudomonas species from people, and it's seen in a wide variety of patients. I already mentioned cystic fibrosis, but we see it in people who have severe burns, acute leukemia, and transplant patients. Infections most often occur at moist body sites. Skin infections in people are most commonly caused by staphylococcus, with the exception of the feet, where Pseudomonas aeruginosa is most common. Treatment is often quite difficult. There's a lot of intrinsic resistance among Pseudomonas, and acquired resistance is increasingly encountered as well. So these are naturally challenging bacteria to treat. And as we see the emergence of antimicrobial resistance, those therapeutic options are becoming more and more limited. I've put a link to a video above that provides some context into the importance of Pseudomonas in cystic fibrosis patients. In fish, Pseudomonas fluorescens is a cause of septicemia in high intensity aquaculture uh, settings. Fish who are infected are lethargic and they may have cutaneous lesions. 
Um, this bacteria is actually quite ubiquitous in the environment. And so we tend to see it in animals who are stressed or otherwise diseased. Um, these infections are actually more common in water that has organic pollutants. Just like Pseudomonas aeruginosa in people, treatment is very challenging because of intrinsic resistance and because of the limited number of drugs which are available for use in aquaculture. Um, many of them are not active against these non-fermentative bacteria. Stenotrophomonas maltophila is associated with septicemia in reptiles and amphibians. And we can think of this as an infection that we see most commonly in either wounded animals or those who are kept with poor husbandry, so particularly animals kept too cold. When you think about systemic infections in reptiles, you want to think non-fermenters. This is the most common group of organisms that you're going to be identifying in these animals. This is a table that I've reproduced from uh, this paper here, which reviewed laboratory results from reptiles. And what you can see is that cutaneous infections were most commonly caused by Pseudomonas aeruginosa, as were respiratory tract infections, while Pseudomonas species and Stenotrophomonas dominated infections of the mouth. In this image here, you can see necrotic stomatitis in a snake. Um, so all of this uh, necrotic, perhaps fibrinous, very friable dead tissue here caused by another species of Pseudomonas, Pseudomonas putrefaciens. Mm -hmm.